Now back in trauma, the moment you've all been waiting for, the four different kinds of shock that cause you to feel traumatized and violated during your exams. That's right, hypovolemic, cardiogenic, neurogenic, and septic shock. All four of these have cardiac and hemodynamic parameters that cause a great deal of confusion for you as the student taking the test. Now, regardless of which exam you're taking, when you're taking it, what day of the week you're taking it, doesn't even matter what month you're taking it, these things do not change. So let's begin with hypovolemic shock. What classically is a hypovolemic shock patient? Classically, you're gonna have a patient who's coming in and they're going to either have severe nausea and vomiting and diarrhea. Maybe they have a C. difficile infection. Elderly patients have a low volume of distribution. When they get C. difficile, they're gonna lose a lot of volume and they can go into hypovolemic shock. Another common cause of hypovolemic shock is not so much just the loss of fluid and volume, but simple hemorrhage, you're just losing pure blood. Patients who actually have an upper GI bleed, say for example they're a cirrhotic and they have esophageal varices and one of them happens to rupture, they can bleed out from that and develop signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock. Lower GI bleeds is another example. Trauma patients can also have a similar presentation. Now patients who are in hypovolemic shock, when you examine them, they're gonna feel cold. They're gonna complain that they're cold. They may not even be mentating because they're not perfusing and they're gonna look pale. They're going to look simply pale because they're hemorrhaging out. Now, because of these tables, what you want to look for is where does the problem begin? Every single form of shock has an area in which the problem begins with that. So let's start with hypovolemic shock. In hypovolemic shock, the problem is, is that your body can't bring blood back to the heart to actually move forward. So we're going to say that your central venous pressure in and of itself is low. In a compensatory mechanism, your body is going to release catecholamines and your renin-angiotensin system to clamp down, and so your systemic vascular resistance is going to do what? It's going to go up. In addition, as a compensatory mechanism, your heart rate's going to go up, but remember, cardiac output is not just heart rate dependent. It's also stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. And what ends up happening when your stroke volume and your cardiac output are not working together? Oh, that's not good. And so basically what happens is your heart rate's going up to try to compensate for the dropping cardiac output, but because you don't have blood to bring back to the heart in the form of preload, you cannot get an adequate stroke volume, and so therefore your cardiac output is decreased, as well as your left ventricular end diastolic pressure. The problem here is that you just don't have enough mobile fluid and blood. There's nothing to pump. So how do you treat that? Well, fluids to give you something to pump, and vasopressors to falsely elevate your blood pressure by clamping down on your arterioles and your pressure. Now, for those of you who are wondering what is the most common cause, because you remember your exams want to know, do you know how the pathophysiology works? Do you know the physiology of all this? Do you know how to treat it? Do you know how to recognize it? But also, do you know what the most common cause is? The most common cause of hypovolemic shock is hemorrhage. But do not forget for a moment that patients with severe pancreatitis can actually third space fluid so severely they can go into hypovolemic shock. Why do you think the treatment of pancreatitis has been the exact same thing for the last 50 years? It's fluids, 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 oh, and yes, more fluids. Why do you think Ranson needed his own criteria to know that if his fluids, 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 and fluids were working well? Well, he did, and he hit it right on the nail. Now we have CAT scanners. We don't need to have Ranson's criteria. If at 48 hours the patient's not getting better, CAT scan them. That is the new age of Ranson. However, what is the single best predictor in pancreatitis of adequate hydration? A drop in your hematocrit and a drop in your BUN from what? Dilution. Now the next form of shock that you need to realize is cardiogenic shock. Now in cardiogenic shock, basically, it answers itself. Where's the problem? In la corazón. That's right, your heart is the problem. In love, your heart is the problem. In cardiogenic shock, so it is. Now the most common cause here is very clear. It's myocardial infarction. The treatment, well whatever the problem is, fix the heart. Fix the heart. But how are you gonna recognize it? Well first of all, these patients are gonna come in and they're gonna say, I'm having chest pain, and the EKGs are gonna show ST elevations. But if they don't, and it's purely physical exam, these patients are gonna be pale and cool. So right then and there, just on exam, you can't tell the difference between hypovolemic shock and cardiogenic shock. That's why you need cardiac parameters. Now where's the problem here? Where's the problem here? Well, the problem, well if it's cardiogenic shock, it's gonna be cardiac output. Your cardiac output is not doing a damn thing. 
And so therefore your stroke volume and your heart rate change isn't going to make any difference. Central venous pressures are going to increase. If your heart's not pumping, you get back pressure. Your systemic vascular resistance goes up because your body's thinking, oh my God, I'm not producing a blood pressure because my cardiac output's not working. What is happening here? Clamp down. Let's try to bring the blood pressure up. Your heart rate goes up to try to maintain that cardiac output, but it's not working because your heart's just like stunned. And lastly, your left ventricular and diastolic pressures are also increased. The way you fix this is you find out what caused the problem. Since the most common cause of the problem is a myocardial infarction, what are you going to do? You're going to cath the patient. You're going to reestablish perfusion. As soon as you reestablish perfusion, that myocyte turns into the Incredible Hulk and just starts smashing blood out of the heart. That's right, it's go time. Now, neurogenic, neurogenic, neurogenic. Neurogenic shock is the one that you're least likely to see on the exam. The most common cause is spinal cord injury. What has happened? You've lost your sympathetic tone. You lose your cervical or your thoracic spinal column. You sever it, something happens to it, and you lose the vascular tone on your arterioles. So if you lose vascular tone, where is the issue? Vascular resistance. So your vascular response drops, your central venous pressure drops, your heart rate goes up to try to maintain it, but because of a lack of return of blood, you don't have stroke volumes, your cardiac output can't be maintained, and your left ventricular and diastolic pressures also drop. In these patients, you're going to give fluids, and you need to reestablish tone. Since there's a neurologic loss of sympathetic tone, you're going to use a chemical means of actually getting the tone there, which means you're going to use vasal pressors. That's right! And lastly, the one that can really be told by physical exam is septic shock. Septic shock is the one that you're most likely going to see on your exam. Septic shock patients are warm and faint. Warm and faint. Warm and faint. Why? Well, in septic shock, the gram-negative lipopolysaccharide layer is releasing toxins causing the patient to vasodilate. Dilation. Open. And so when they vasodilate, their systemic vascular resistance drops. In that same regard, the CVP drops. In that same way, the heart rate tries to go up, but the heart becomes hypodynamic. And that is the way to tell the difference between septic shock and everything else. Cardiac output is increased. If you learn nothing in these few minutes, remember that cardiac output is increased on septic shock. You'll save a life. You'll also get a question right. Left ventricular end diastolic pressure is not increased. There's no change whatsoever. It has no effect. How do you treat these patients? Very straightforward. What you're going to do is you're going to give them fluid boluses. How are you going to figure it out? Well, it's about 15 cc per kilogram, which works out to about 500 cc aliquots. You're going to give them a couple of liters that way. The blood pressure responds fantastic. You're also going to give antibiotics. So remember, antibiotics within 30 minutes of recognition of sepsis has been shown to reduce mortality. And if those things don't work, you're going to give vasopressors because the point in all the treatments here, the point in all of the treatments here is what? Maintain perfusion. The most common organisms to cause issues in septic shock are as follows. In the gram-negative category, it's going to be E. coli. In the gram-positive category, it's going to be Staphylococcus. So on your exam, on the day of the test, you get a patient and they start seeing all these things like CVP and SVR and you start freaking out. Don't freak out. Remember what I'm telling you. Analyze the patient, see what the signs and symptoms are, look at the history, and try to narrow down what kind of shock it is. Then when they tell you, well, pick what parameter sort of, you know, menu seems to be the right one for this patient, start with the problem and then derive the rest. Because you can have a cause and effect relationship as I've just demonstrated to you. I'll see you in the next section.